Thank you. Thank you so much. Not not the best practices, just just our best practices, but hopefully we can do some sharing already at the break. What conversation? It's just looking forward to these next two days very much. Lilith, Jeanette, thank you so much. It's an honor to, to be here. The talk's already outstanding, and I hope to add a little bit to that. My name is Brendan McGinty. I graduated from the University of Illinois. That's where I am back working. What an honor. I'd just like to be here on their behalf and with you. What's interesting is my first job after college was actually here. After university was, was part of developing a electronic mail system on a computer network called Plato that was affiliated with KTH. And it was a graphics enabled, basically line drawings. This was 1988. I was a systems programmer on that system and the programming was great. I could handle the programming. The hard part was actually reading the comments, which were all in Swedish. It was fresh out of the United States. I didn't know what was happening. Everyone was very patient with me, and I appreciated that very much. After I left Sweden, it was a long career of corporate consulting and government consulting, Department of Energy, Department of Defense in the U.S., um, and then big companies, mainly large companies around the United States primarily. And it was in an area of optimization. It was leveraging technology as it evolved constantly. And that was my role as my own business owner, working for other companies, but mainly being in boardrooms and working with executives from large companies on how to improve operations. We're still doing that today. I've been with NCSA for several years. I lead their industrial program. They are very, they are very nice to me, and yet not always nice to me, by enabling me to do other things, like lead a Center for Digital Agriculture. Center for AI Innovation and a Digital Transformation Institute. I could provide buzzwords all day long for you. But what's common about this is that industry has a play in all of it. And I'm very fortunate because when I joined NCSA, we have a program that has been around for a long time. I'm not going to get into all of the details here, but 1986, the, the, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications on the Illinois campus, two hours south of Chicago, by the way, that formed in 1985. National Science Foundation funded the U.S. supercomputing network. And our director was smart and the, and the founder, the, the concept behind it, one of our professors was smart enough to name ours the National Center. That served us well for, for many years. And so 1986, I think, is the first year. Now, don't blame us for the fact that Kodak is no longer here. They were our first partner, but they just, they went another direction after a while. That didn't always have to do with digital. I think one of the interesting things to note on this slide is 2011. We made a specific investment in an industry uh, dedicated cluster for industry use only. So industry would come in. So back in 1986, it was a million U.S. dollars pay to play on the one machine that we had. And it happened to be the biggest one at the time. In 2011, some machines were more commonplace, of course. But this was a CPU cluster. We weren't even talking GPUs then, certainly. Actually, not until just a few years ago, if you remember. So 2011, iForge came to be. And we had industrial users, competitors in many cases, use that cluster. Served us very well. They paid on a per core hour basis. And that was, that was what iForge has been. We decommissioned that machine about two months ago. It stayed evergreen for quite a while. But now we have our director, Bill Gropp, is well known, the father of mass message passing interface. He's our director right now. And he thinks that the approach now is a garden approach to resources. That's why joint undertakings and consortia are very interesting because all the machines don't have to be the same. All the resources don't have to be the same. And I think that we're looking at more of a garden variety that is a customized approach to delivering custom solutions to industrial players. 
that Exxon Mobil run in 2017 set a world record. That was pretty much CPUs. We went broad with it. We optimized code. It meant a lot to them, a billion dollars US ROI on a 10 minute run because it was running three and a half months on prem in Houston on their big, big cluster. But we were able to empty out Blue Waters to a machine that we also just decommissioned. 10 year old machine that was a $250 million National Science Foundation machine that we just decommissioned. I wish I had access to some of the copper that has left the building because I thought that would be pretty lucrative, but it's, it's such a massive machine in our data center. And then in 2020, this is when we really noticed that the majority of our industrial partners have made the transition to almost all of them want AI, some sort of AI. A lot of them don't know what that means, of course. They come in and say, we think that's going to help us. Can, can you help us with that? What, is, what, what, what can we possibly do in this area to improve whatever their challenge is? So let me get into a little bit about, we always have the splash screens. And what's interesting about this one is the ones on the left, Caterpillar, Rolls-Royce, John Deere, they've been with us for 20, 25, 30 years, started in the traditional HPC world of modeling and simulation. Now, all AI, all trying to optimize workloads and use cases that are challenges to them as they make the digital transformation. That's why all these pieces come together. Companies that have been around for a while struggle with this. They, they, they really are trying to figure out what technology can do for them and they become a little overwhelmed with all of their options. It's overwhelming to us, <laughs> but we're able to consult with them to provide some of those, some of those answers. The other thing to note here is the variety of sectors involved. These are current partners. AbbVie is one of the biggest uh, drug discovery companies, pharmaceuticals. Syngenta feeds the planet like John Deere. And these are multinational companies that work with a lot of different organizations, institutions. One of my points here will be made about, that we were just talking during break, Rolls-Royce works with everyone, always has the national labs in the United States, other supercomputing centers around the world, they have operations all over the world. There's a little bit there for everyone. And the challenges match us in a high performance world. We also try to be pretty agnostic about the, when I talked about the, the garden approach to compute, that's because we have to work with everyone. <laughs> that also includes commercial cloud. Most of our partners, work with AWS and Azure and Google Cloud, that's fine. There's still specialty area for on-prem, high-performance computing resources, and we're gonna get into some of why that is. But you can see the standard cast of characters. IBM's been good to our university recently because when they changed CEOs, it happened to be an Illinois graduate, and that <laughs> helped with some of the flow to Illinois recently. There's a big institute, and they're talking about Exascale to quantum, and they're, they're making a huge play in quantum. The other ones are interesting because one of, one of my points of challenge for all of us is the fact that we lack resources, so we have to depend on collaborations. With us, we've worked with Barcelona Supercomputing for a long time, Compute Ontario or Compute Canada or Endrio, whichever you want to call the Canadian uh, data-driven leadership there. Cypress Institute has been a good partner for us. And because we're a university, we have this mix, this challenge like so many of us do in trying to mix academia and industry in ways that align. My argument is, it's not even an argument, it's just a point, and that is all academic research aligns with some industrial challenge. We always have the answers. The trick is, making it attractive and of value to the companies. And this is where some of these other partner organizations, if I'm short a computational chemist, I can go somewhere else and get it and don't have to hire it. There's enough out there as far as the talented domain expertise that knows how to leverage these resources for us to be able to make, make good use of. And then just a quick le legacy partners for us, I call them graduates. They graduate from us, some of them come back Philip 66, a big oil and gas partner of ours, was gone for a few years, came back. BP's come and gone. 
Rolls Royce once once came and went, and they and they're and they're back. But these are just again the sectors from the early days of NCSA. Early on, it wasn't just modeling and sim, and I think that's what's interesting. And then there are some some I will call them underrealized domain expertise areas that I think companies yearn for that we may not be aware of. And some of these companies utilized it at NCSA a while back, and I'm going to get into that in just a second. Mission, vision, value statements, they're always useful, but rarely do, do people pay attention to them. You know, for us, it is the high-performance computing providing superior expertise in areas that companies Companies, when you look at, at a, a balance sheet for a company, what they struggle with is controlling payroll. And so if, it, if it's a drug discovery company, an energy company, they may not want to staff up with a bunch of high-performance computing experts. They would want to go and find expertise to align with what their needs are because they can let us go or they can work project to project with us. That's how we work project to project. So when they're done with us, we might not have work with them for a few months and then we'll come back. That's good for us because we just want to stay at this level that is different than some of the traditional corporate consultants, traditional IT consultants, nothing against them, but this is a different level that we have to address with companies. And then the values. I highlighted my, my most important areas. I like to say that things take care of themselves. If you are truly partner-centric, client-centric. It sounds like a common expression, like in hospitals, you're patient-centric. Well, are you? Do you mean it? And so, and that builds, I heard my friend Andreas uh, talk in Stuttgart just a couple of days ago, and he talked about trust. Very important. We talk about all the technology, all of the capabilities, all of that. Well, I'm out to convince companies that they need us. And the way that that works is with our integrity. We're, it's lucky for us, I think, because we're a not-for-profit university. That gives us a distinct advantage in working with companies. We're not out to put our hands in your pockets. Please pay us for what we do, but we can't make profit. And we can grow our program. If you have a lot to do, we can grow to help you more, but we're a not-for-profit we are independent. We're agnostic about who we work with on the compute side. There are huge advantages to that. And we're a university, so they come to us for thought leadership. They come to us for, for young talent. What an advantage that is to come into companies and be that different. I think that that's unique, especially when it comes to high-performance computing, because people who don't have that level of experience that people in this room or folks like us at our university have or throughout other centers, I'm wide open about how we work. Our membership model, you pay $50,000 a year for membership if you are a big company. And typically they sign up for three-year engagement, three-year commitment at a time. Now, hopefully we're doing something right. There's a reason why Caterpillar and John Deere and others, Rolls-Royce have been with us for many, many years. And it's because we will deliver value to them that makes it worth paying that 50 grand. If you're in our, our, we have a big research park, our compute center, because it's close to campus power, very important, is adjacent to our research park. It's an optic for companies to come in and see corporate labels on our research park buildings, and then to see this enormous building that houses our compute infrastructure. It's just a, a, a fortunate advantage, but it helps to have been in the business for 30 years and working this and convincing people that that there's value here, which we've been able to prove. And then if you're a small company, we drop the cost significantly. 2,500 a year, I, I'm not quite sure how we came up with that, but it seemed to be a sweet spot for companies because we want to make it for SMEs to be able to afford access not only to the compute, but access to us, our, our domain expertise, and I'll, I'll get into that. So this, this model, what do you get out of it? When companies come to universities, they come because they want student talent. They want their next generation. We are trying to engage 
those companies in projects with us directly to train the next generation of HPs, e, HPC experts at the student level. And you can call it what you want, advanced computing, supercomputing, HPC might be quantum. It's quantum part of HPC. We'll, we'll get there on terminology. That's still work in progress. The compute resources now, it's not just, hey, can I get a sliver of some massive computer that overwhelms me? Because when I would give tours of Blue Waters, which took up a, in, a norm, like, a, like a football field in size, a lot of companies would say, I don't need all that. That's too much. Well, we're not talking about that. You, you've got potential use cases that would benefit from that horsepower. When you join us, the deal that we make is our already fairly low labor rates. If I'm in, if I'm Deloitte or, or one of these other large consulting firms, they come in to companies and they'll charge $700-ish US per hour for talent. We are a sliver of that at the university. And you get PhD level talent who's done this for a long time, master's level students, students who are studying that still have value and we have slight tiers that make it very affordable for people to leverage our labor. If they're not partners, we will do a proof of concept for them. They'll pay a little bit more. If they're not willing to be a partner, our reputation is already good, so I feel like you should join or not. But if you choose not to, we will prove it. And I'll get to why we're, we're able to prove it. And then we do a lot of research, publish that. I'm about to host an annual uh, meeting of just industrial users. It's virtual. So if you want to attend it, uh, please see me. It's October 19 and 20. I'll let you know about that. Uh, just all of the events that are around, especially what others are doing with HPC and the results that they're getting. People want to hear from others that they already can relate to. AbV on the drug discovery side knew about the work we were doing with Mayo Clinic, the largest U.S. health system. Huh. Well, that's similar because that's genomics work, and we need to leverage compute resource because the data is so large. And they talk with AbV directly because they're not direct competitors, and then they come and, and engage with us. So sometimes the best people to tell the story, it's not us. It's, it's having the companies talk on a par. And then this is, it seems pretty typical, <clears throat> but I'll tell you what's different. We'll spend more time on the discover, discovery, call it what you want, phase, initial meetings to scope out exactly what we're talking about. So important because you, it's the 80-20 rule, save all that time in the end, the more time you spend up front, making sure that you understand needs and that the other end who's paying understands what they're getting for that and trust the fact that what you're telling them is accurate. And at the end, I think of the end is lost a lot. In, in, the, in the final stage, people don't take the time to evaluate. Was that effective? Because they're on to the next project as soon as they can be. You start to get burnt out a little bit. You've been on a project for a long time. No, no, no. You have to finish strong. And by finish strong, I'm very fortunate because I've got a program large enough to employ program managers, project managers, we will calculate return on investment for you. Follow on work is easy when you're able to show ROI to companies. And when you go in and you say this, call a project, $100,000 project over a few months that resulted in $18 million US dollars of, of return on investment for you annually because of optimizing some workload, huh? And they say, well, what can we do next? I'll, I'll use one example. We did it for Philip. I'll use Philip 66. Again, we were optimizing octane recipe for them. And they said that we worked on 85 octane to start. They said that, uh, that resulted in you know, 14 to $16 million of, of annual savings for them. When can we get on to? The next octane levels and we've just been walking through that and as a result of that work suddenly we get supply chain work which is an issue for everyone and because of consulting you start to enter into trusted conversations about their biggest challenges and when you have that uh the work the work flows 
with our program that the the statement at the top is is feel, feels a little arrogant about it, but but there was a quote by one of our oil and gas partners that said that their goal was to stay six months behind us, which keeps them six months ahead of their competition in working with us. And we work very collaboratively. And how we do it is with the standard technical teams, which means application and uh, compute side resources, all of those compute resources. But what I highlighted down here was the commitment that we've made to managing business around it, right? I'm an old programmer. I'm a retired programmer, sadly. I just haven't done it in a while. And that, but it gives, it gives me the ability to understand what we are trying to do and go into companies where I've done that for years and say, what is your problem? Let's match it up. Then I hand it to program managers who manage accounts. I've got one who just handles our life sciences clients. That could be drug discovery, um, healthcare, agriculture, all, all of that. And then I've got somebody who handles all of the rest, energy, manufacturing, et cetera, aerospace, and then project managers. So key because we have a lot of expertise that wastes their time trying to manage projects, trying to track budgets, have a professional do it, <laughs> have them have a P, a, 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 be certified, and have them know what they're doing and get out of their way to let them execute on projects so that you don't have to worry about it. and your expertise can drive home with your client what you're trying to do. And then on the culture side, something we lose, we think it's all about us. At the university, we think it's all about us. Oh, we've got all these great students. We've got all this great, all this incredible research is happening. We do. Companies don't care. <laughs> they don't. They, they care about their, their problem, their challenge. And it's up to us to, to, to note that. And you know, I'll use Phillips one more time. We worked at daily stand-up pace with them because that's how they do business. We are going to customize our solutions for them. And it's to everyone's benefit when you do that. We've got these areas of expertise. A lot of them look similar. Modeling and SIM is where it all started when it comes to HPC. But our growth areas are in genomics. And I highlighted GIS because when I said earlier, under-realized opportunities, geospatial information is important to every single company. Can you name one where that doesn't matter? When was the last time we offered some sort of GIS-driven project to companies. So we have to put it in terms that helps them to understand the value proposition of engaging with geospatial solutions. And that's an area of growth for us. And the other ones we have, just, just when the data deluge started, what, five, six years really started, we quadrupled in size in terms of engagement, revenue, everything. And it was because of the data side. Perfect. You know why? Because companies have caught up to us in HPC land. They need us now because they have so much data. And I, I get so many that come in and say, I've got all this data. I don't know what to do with it. I think I can do, get, you know, derive some intelligence about it. Now they're starting to sort of figure it out a little bit. That's good because we don't want to start at this discussion. We want to start here so we can start designing solutions collaboratively with them immediately. The other one that I, you know, security I have, I have highlighted because I'll say just in, in digital agriculture, I get to, to lead that center for us and the cybersecurity issues around the food system during harvest. It's a challenge. And I've talked with our federal Bureau of investigation FBI, about, about potential hacking into that. What are we going to do about it? What, what are we going to do to address the security parts of working with a financial institution to protect personal health information? It's incredibly important when you can gain the trust of these huge organizations in the environment that we're in with all the data that they have. And then advanced visualization is an underrealized, I believe, solution set that could be VR, AR, some sort of immersive technology. It could be 
some sort of cinematic visualization that illustrates points. It's expensive. It's where shared resources, having an area of expertise that can work with you is important because the visualization part for companies, seeing is believing. Show me. What does this mean? Show me. Oh, I could, I could buzzword them to death and have really interesting conversations, but show me, and then you're going to gain engagement. We have a data center that's fantastic, really poorly named. That's why I struck out PETA in the name. We are the National PETA Scale Computing Facility. So we're in need of a rename. If you have any ideas, I would appreciate knowing them. Um, but this serves us well. And it's the energy part of this is important because you can pass that on to industrial partners and talk about that. Because when we work with industry, we fully load our work. They play, pay for the floor space that the compute's on, the people that are supporting it, the application side support. All of that goes into the mix that comes up with the team and the hourly rates and the compute costs to support our operations. And I think what we're learning more than, more than anything is we've had some companies who have graduated from us and tried to do their own compute and then come back and said, that was hard. And that's not our core business anyway. Small businesses say, I can't afford that. So they, they want to use us and that, that final part, we do it so they don't have to. We will provide sophisticated, advanced compute support and in an area that's extremely important, user support, which if there's something that I hear about, there's no, no offense to commercial cloud. We use them. We, we love them. They're part of the equation, but they're not really always well known for their support. And I think that's an issue when you, when you provide these soft skills, it's important to the success and the satisfaction of having someone want to work with you again. So best I put in quotes because it's just, it's just us. Yeah, do it, use it, use it as you see fit. The, the presentation will be available. The, the most important things to me, companies come to all of us because of the, the talent, the people that know how to use the resources. Resources have always changed. Oh, they've changed through the years. When I worked here, it was mainframe, you know, shared resources back in the 80s. Now we're talking about, I saw Frontier, number one machine with its own struggles. Just a, couple, just a few weeks ago at Oak Ridge National Labs, it's changing all the time. Where's, when's the next one? How am I going to be able to leverage that resource? No, it's about the talent. The other thing is sometimes when you're in the environment, companies will come to you to say that they want to visit your Go to them. Go to them. It matters. It's their turf. They're more comfortable there. Go to them and say, I just want 30 minutes of your time. Start that conversation in their environment because they're, that's part of building the trust. You're willing to take the time to go and see them. That, I think that, that matters. And it's, it's a, a little bit of a loss. I know it is at our university. We have a big university, so people just flock, right? A lot of times for some sort of uh, recruitment day, and and it's a fire hose to them. They they it's too much. So go to go to them on their terms. Many times I know I I don't know if this resonates with you, but in my, my environment, I work with a lot of talented professors who are very anxious to lay out all of their research for a company as soon as they get there. And by slide eighty eight, they don't want to hear it anymore. These are the soft skills involved. And I'm telling you, as a corporate consultant, for many, many years, being able to go in and say, what is it? What's your biggest pain point? What's keeping you up at night? What are the top two or three things that are, that are affecting your business? And when you're able to hear that, whatever you say after that can at least be customized. And I try to coach my teams, whether they are researchers or domain experts, to do that, to be consultative. They don't have any time. Nobody does. So recognize that. The resources, 
who has enough? Raise your hand if you have enough resources. Okay, because you don't. Nobody does. We are, we are I, I tell my leadership that we could be at least five-fold bigger in the last three years than we are now if we had the resources that we had. Who doesn't believe that? So we have to share. Sounds easy. It's really hard to do because it takes time to spend the time to do that. The soft skills and leveraging those resources because of the domain expertise, we don't know it all. There are people much more advanced in certain areas than us. We want the best offering for our clients, no matter what the expertise is. We want them to come to us to ask what to do and then for us to handle that for them because there's enough to go around. I'm here to tell you that if you provide value to companies and have a return on investment associated with it, that it will be obvious <laughs> that there's enough to collaborate on to go around. I just took one of our biggest partners and introduced them to a national lab near us, Argon in Chicago. We're going to work collaboratively. Well, it cost me a little bit of business. Well, not in the big picture because I'm bringing in Argon to provide more solutions to this company. Where did they get that idea? Well, and we're going to work as collaboratively as we can because there's so much work that companies need done. The other th and, and the other thing is this, you think products sometimes, companies will take open source software. We've got great data wrangling, data analysis software, federally funded, open source, and we will take it and we will customize it for companies and deliver something specific to them. In agriculture, in energy, we've, we've leveraged these resources. It gets us 75% of the way down the road because most of the work has already been done by the open source software and then we customize the final part of it. Custom solutions are what companies need. They productize the HR side, the finance side, that's fine. Not us, That's just it just can't happen. So these are the simple, how many of these are, are the soft skills? How many of these have to do with having the biggest machine? The size of the machine helps. Having that resource available helps because the, the data is going to demand it. And so it's the soft skills that, that really sell it because we all feel the same things. We're all looking for investment. <laughs> so much of it goes to power. We run 25 megawatts at the, at the university. It uses up, that single building uses up 20 to 25% of our power on all of campus, 50,000 student campus. Our bills are, are high. <laughs> So power is important, talent, including diversity. Oh, we talk a great diversity game. I don't, I don't mean to be cynical about it. We're really diver We're dedicated to diversity. Well, are we? Right? So let's prove it. How are we going to get the next generation and a diverse population involved in HPC? What's it going to be called that attracts the next generation of talent to us? Industry, especially with SMEs, exascale, everybody's dealing with. Quantum is next. It all leads to the fact that we need to collaborate. Have to. The magic is in that. So I'm going to leave it at that. Please contact me uh, when, whenever you need. I appreciate your time so much. It's an honor to be here. I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you very much.